My name is Laura Minkini and I'm the founder of Mikey Guy. We are a digital hub for the 50 plus demographic, but um, and we're not ages, so we accept people of any age as we're neither you or I are 50 plus. Our mission is to promote longevity, living with health span via social engagement and preventative wellness concepts. Um, I am very excited to have tonight Drew Taylor, the CEO and founder of Acorn Biolabs. It is a Toronto-based biotech company, which is making uh, cell, stem cells collection and banking very easy and affordable. What I'm very excited about is the fact that this technology is something that you can get now and make use for of it in the future. I, you know, from doing a lot of studying in um, the aging process, one of the things that scares people a lot is um, the one thing that scares people about aging is losing their minds. So diseases such as Alzheimer's and dementia. And I think what's very exciting about what Acorn is doing and what Drew is going to talk to you about is the fact that you will be potentially be able to make use of future technologies with the service they're providing now. So without much ado, um, Drew, I'm going to turn over the um, mic to you. And thanks for being here with us tonight. No, thank you so much. Um, I will just take a minute to uh, share. Can you guys see the slides right now? No, not yet. OK, let me hit share. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. I really uh, appreciate the uh, introduction, and I am very excited to be uh, bringing Acorn uh, um, today to uh, to the webinar and and sharing it with uh, with your group. Um, it has definitely been uh, the space in general has been a, a lifelong passion of mine, and um, Acorn is just the the kind of recent uh, formalization of it. Um, so that being said. Um, I, uh, I definitely have gone through the thank yous, but I'm really, really excited to be here because this is um, very much in speaking with you, Laura, mindsets are, are very much aligned on this. And um, one of uh, Acorn's really missions in life is to give you back more years um, to you know, more healthy years to do the things that uh, you love doing and, and spending time with the people that you love. So this actually started for me uh, a long time ago, um, all the way back in, in grade seven. I, uh, I had this amazing opportunity of actually going into an OR and witnessing a surgery. Um, we actually had a grade seven school-wide science project. And the project was we had to break down something mechanically and, and share how it works and describe its function, its utility, all of those things. And so of course, like most kids in grade seven, I chose a total knee arthroplasty. Uh, it was a very popular choice at the time. I was competing with a number of other individuals. Actually not, I was the only one. Um, but that's what I chose. And I was really in a great position because my father was a physician and um, worked in sports medicine. And so I ended up being able to actually go witness it at one of the hospitals that he formerly worked at, um, a surgery. Uh, essentially to take out the surface the cartilage surface and, and some of the bone from a person's knee and put back in metals and plastics. That person had uh, advanced osteoarthritis, um, actually got it fairly early in life. Um, so it was a young woman that was going in that actually surprised me when I, I met her. Um, but I got to go in and see them do this um, quite you know invasive, huge surgery. Um, and at the time for me, it was this moment of awe because it was the first time I was actually seeing any of these things um, right in front of my eyes, right? And I remember every moment um, walking through the surgical double doors, um, you know, going into that area of the hospital, the different smell, right? The, the alcohol and iodine smell that's almost in the air of, of you know, that feeling of sterility, um, going over to the big double base and sink and cleaning under my fingernails and doing all of those things to get ready to go in and scrubbing up. Um, I, I will never forget putting on a gown for the first time. Um, the thing that actually struck me the most uh, was how young the woman was. Um, when I was envisioning going in to see somebody that, that couldn't walk anymore because of knee pain, I was picturing somebody that, uh, that was extremely elderly. And for me at, at grade seven, seeing this young woman, um, uh, well, I guess the middle-aged woman going through this, I was um, actually kind of astounded. What ended up being um, probably the most 
influential kind of turning point of my life was not the day of the surgery. It was the day after. Um, I was in awe the whole time watching every person on this medical team perform their duty, but really it was the next day. Uh, I got to shadow the surgeon when they did their rounds and actually visited that patient after the surgery. And I will never forget, she got up out of bed, stood up on her own feet and gave the doctor a hug and said, thank you, because um, even though it was so quickly after, she was already able to take steps. And I, I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. it gave me goosebumps really to see this person gain back uh, really their sense of freedom, uh, their independence. Uh, they'd come in on a wheelchair and they walked out of the hospital. And so, so that left me um, really passionate about wanting to do this for the rest of my life. And I ended up staying very close with that um, physician. And I had a number of conversations with them after that while I was still, you know, in that young. Um, but one of them was around what would happen to that person as time went on. And I was told that, you know, these are metals and plastics, they're going to break down over time. And unfortunately, that, um, that person is probably going to come back for another surgery. You know, maybe 15 years later, and another 10 years of that need another. And eventually, you know, there won't be enough bone stock and, and that, that patient would be back in a wheelchair again. What they said was in the future, what we hope to do is actually not put in metals and plastics that will break down over time and not interface with your own tissues nearly as well, but actually be able to regrow your own tissues. You know, regrow that person cartilage and bone from their own cells and put that in to restore function. And that way those, those tissues would be able to heal, respond to shear forces and stresses, and hopefully could be a lifelong resource for them. And so that conversation stuck with me and, and really kind of directed my career. And I, I ended up um, you know, studying uh, down at the University of Michigan in, in molecular and cell biology and came back up to the University of Toronto uh, to study biomedical engineering. And that is where I really was exposed to this amazing um, world of regenerative medicine. I was also exposed to the reality of, of that we are not right here today doing these things, that we're working on perfecting them, we're working on, on doing them. And, I, and I've seen amazing progressions, but we're still in a reality today where every 30 seconds a patient dies from a disease that could be treated by replacing that tissue. So when we think about regenerative medicine and, and what that is, it's really about taking um, cells from the body and replacing those parts. Everything from stem cell therapies to gene therapies where we modify the genes so the cells can perform better, to 3D bioprinting, the idea of actually putting all those cells together to form an organ that can actually serve function in our body. And then even tissue engineering around different areas of the body. Um, and, and a good example of that would be what I ended up spending my career on, which was working in cartilage and bone, following that same footstep starting in grade seven. I was back at that same hospital, Mount Sinai, here in Toronto. And I worked with uh, a group where we were actually going into the OR and taking biopsies of patients that were going in for arthroplastic surgery and seeing in practice in the laboratory if we could actually grow out those tissues for them so that they could actually have these, this, this potential of, of, in the future, we would do this you know, for patients. But at the time it was practice to see if we could do it functionally. It worked very well in animal models. Um, and my job was really to translate that into human models. And needless to say, it didn't go perfectly. Um, but we uh, will get into some of those details later. What I wanna describe is the exciting transformations that have happened in the industry. And it's really about the tools that we have at our disposal. Oftentimes when, when I talk about stem cells, I, I try to relate it to some other technology that we're well aware of and, and that we use uh, every day, maybe not so much during COVID-19. Um, but the Wright brothers in 1903 discovered flight. So uh, a momentous occasion, an amazing discovery and, and invention really. And um, they also traveled 100 feet-ish. So functionally, even though we had discovered flight, we weren't able to really implement it for any use for us. It would actually be four decades, almost four decades that would pass before there was a commercial flight that crossed the Atlantic. And what it was is not the discovery of flight, but additional tools on top of that discovery 
that allowed us to improve it to the point where we could actually take use of it. And that's really the period of time that we are in, in cells. And we are seeing those tools emerge in this space that are actually allowing us to harness this as a technology and use it for our benefit. And this is a bold statement, but in theory, we now have the tools needed to treat any disease. And this is why the first tool is iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. This is a Nobel Prize winning technology from 2012. This is the ability to take a, a human adult cell and draw it all the way back into behaving like an embryonic stem cell. That magic moment when a sperm meets egg and that cell can become any other cell type in the entire human body. So what this means is we can now take a skin cell and create a neuron, a bone cell, a liver cell, muscle cells, any type of cell that you need. An amazing technology that also creates an immortal cell like the embryonic stem cell, right? Like that can replicate indefinitely. So now by taking a small sample of skin cells, we can turn that into an iPSC and then create a billion kidney cells that would be needed to create an entire organ. It's completely revolutionized what is possible. The other technology just was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2020. So this is CRISPR. And essentially it is cut and paste for the human genome. We now have the ability to go in and look at segments of code, identify code that would end up leading to disease and modifying that code with this tool so that that disease will never progress. Unbelievably powerful. So powerful that we are across the world taking our time to implement this. Um, it is with any of these new tools, it, it is, up to us as patients to exude some patience as we make sure that these, these new therapies are safe and efficacious before we start to see them enter mainstream medicine. But what I'm excited about is we now have these tools that give us the ability to think about things that were science fiction before as reality today. And that is regenerative medicine. Instead of figuring out how to ameliorate symptoms with devices, chemical drugs, we will regenerate function of organs and damaged tissues so that at the end of the treatment, you're the same as before you needed that treatment. This is said by Dr. Alan Russell, an amazing uh, regenerative medicine researcher. So ultimately what we are trying to do is make sure that we are reversing that damage by making sure that we're replacing it with functional tissues. And a lot of people kind of make the analogy to a car as certain parts break down over time. You can replace that one part and make sure that that car is maintained. And so humans are, are, are no different. We do have you know, parts all over us that as they break down, we should be able to replace those parts with healthy versions of them. And because of those tools that I talked about before, this is happening all over the world. Enormous amounts of money and funding and research at, at universities and private institutions everywhere are investigating the utility of all of these, these tools that we have at our disposal now to actually create treatments. And these scientists and physicians around the world are applying these tools to the very focus they spent their career on. So, you know, physicians that were working on, on looking at uh, treatments for the kidney now have these extra assets to help further their research to bring these therapies to life. And so we are in a time point today where we know a number of examples of regenerative medicine therapies that are available today, but it's a relatively small amount. When you look at the numbers of clinical trials that are happening all across the world, in the next decade, we are going to see this watershed moment where it's almost going to be like every time we turn around, we're going to be seeing another application of regenerative medicine reaching mainstream medicine. And like I said, this research and, and these, these therapies are happening head to toe. Uh, everything from hair loss down to diabetic foot ulcer. Some of the world's toughest diseases like macular degeneration and Parkinson's disease are actually in phase one clinical trials right now, leveraging your own cells to treat those diseases. In Tel Aviv, they've 3D printed a miniature human heart. It's about the size of a rabbit's heart, but they can get it to beat and actually pump blood through it. So we are making these giant leaps forward 
towards actually being able to conceptually create a heart on demand for a patient that needs a new heart. You know, groups down uh, at University of Washington and Rice University have actually created these vascular networks and been able to tissue engineer them. MIT is growing miniature lab-grown kidneys. Uh, at Wake Forest, uh, an amazing regenerative medicine physician actually recreated a human bladder from a patient's own cells. A patient had spina bifida and they did not have the control of their bladder. So they weren't able to hold their urine. And by replacing their bladder with this tissue engineered lab grown bladder, that was part 3D printed and part CD, uh, 3D cultured with, with cells, they were actually able to recreate uh, this, this young woman, a bladder. And now she can hold her own urine and has an unbelievably higher quality of life. But we have seen the creation of, of cartilage and bone, a lot for aesthetic purposes right now. Like obviously you can see in the picture below, like making, uh, making a, an ear appear in a dish. Um, and then also skin um, for burn victims and diabetic foot ulcers is where that really started, where we can actually recreate these sheets of skin that can be used to put over top of open wounds and, and in institute healing. There is a problem, and I alluded to it before in, in my career, when we first translated these, these examples into human models, what we actually learned was that the animal models were all being done on very young animals, like adolescent and below. And so we had these animals that were really in a developmental stage of their cellular life. And so of course, those cells grew extremely well when we put it into practice. When we were going into the OR and taking biopsies of patients that were going in for arthroplastic surgery, the age range was definitely skewed much higher. And so by taking those cells, we ended up discovering that the age of the cells and how far those cells have progressed down a disease state limits their ability to be used, to be grown and leveraged really for these tissue engineering strategies. And so it was kind of a dramatic moment in my life where ultimately we realized that our cells are aging and that is actually affecting our ability to use them for all of these amazing treatments that are going on all over the world. And so I saw this moment in the future where we were going to end up having to go to people and say, yes, this therapy, this treatment is now available, but unfortunately your cells have degraded enough that you're no longer uh, a good applicant for it. And that is something that we did not want to see happen. And it, it is very pervasive across our cells. Like we see the shortening of telomeres that uh, is a whole topic that we can spend a webinar speaking about uh, alone. Um, but I see our telomeres shortening throughout our lives, free radical damage accumulating and persisting in cells, DNA mutations. Some studies have demonstrated that your DNA mutations double every decade of your life. Um, protein aggregates clogging up cellular machinery and getting in the way, cellular atrophy really just the loss of the mass and the rigidity of the cells. And of course, we can see that mostly with our skin. And so these things that are happening to our cells are affecting our ability to leverage them. And it makes sense. Precisely when we need our cells the most, later in life, usually when we do experience the onset of chronic diseases, our cells are at their absolute worst. What we really need to be doing is actually taking these cells when they're at their best and leveraging them in the future uh, when we need them most and we need to regain that health. And that really is what ACORN has done. We have tried to create a solution around allowing you to have access to your cells to leverage in the future. Live cell collection, and we've made it accessible and, and personal. So this is something where we had some big challenges that we needed to solve here because the idea of extracting your cells previous to this was really thought to be bone marrow. Uh, at the point of childbirth, you could, you could harvest your umbilical cord uh, tissue. Um, but ultimately, those are especially bone marrow extraction is extremely expensive, extremely painful. And you are looking to have that done in an OR with physicians that is essentially located right next to a cryogenics facility because you're in a race for time to get those cells frozen down. And so what we did is we focused on non-invasive cell sources. So because of these technologies like IPSC, we're able to take cells from anywhere and create the cell types we need. So that dependence on trying to find pockets of stem cells that have greater potential, uh, we don't need to do that anymore. On top of that, 
we spent a great deal of time in the laboratory inventing medias that would allow us to transport the cells so that they could be taken from remote areas, other clinics, smaller clinics, sent and sent to cryogenic storage spaces, or even your own home and sent back for storage. And so our media is really important because it keeps your cells alive and happy uh, during that in between when it goes from, from you to the laboratory. The other amazing thing is, is that we did this non-invasively, like I said, um, by just plucking your hair follicles. We've all plucked a, a hair at some point in our lives, uh, women and men alike. And that root, the bulb, contains over 20,000 live cells. And those cells are skin cells. They're keratinocytes and fibroblasts. And those cells can be leveraged in the future using those technologies to turn them into all of those other cell types. So we don't need to do these invasive, expensive procedures like drill into bone marrow or liposuction surgery to, to withdraw adipocytes. And what we've done as a company is right here in, in Toronto, our hometown, we've built out um, a world-class uh, uh, ISO certified clean room facility. So maybe not all of these, these words make sense, but um, this is really what uh, a slide that I'm, I'm extremely proud of. Um, we've created an end-to-end -end solution um, to allow you to actually preserve your cells under the absolute most premium conditions and cryogenically preserve them in liquid nitrogen, essentially freezing them in time so that you will have access to them for your entire life in the future. And that is exciting because essentially this is a resource that will act for you lifelong uh, that you will have access to that is your younger, healthiest self. The other thing that I, I think is extremely important to communicate whenever you're talking about healthcare um, is two principles that, that we really have built this company around, which is transparency and consent. We are the curators of your cells. And essentially we wanna create access for you to have your cells in the future. And so we do this in a way where they are your cells and you control their fate and their destiny and the information within them. A lot of people ask me when I give these questions, well, where can you do this? Um, so it is interesting times right now. Obviously we're doing a webinar where I think uh, Laura, you and I are both in Toronto. So it, you know, hopefully uh, on another day, it'll, it'll be an in-person uh, gathering. Um, but we, we started off being available at uh, Toronto General Hospital where we built out our uh, ISO laboratory. Uh, we're really excited to be also working with the Executive Health Center in North York to offer the services through, through their facility as well. And uh, you can find it at a number of Coverdale clinics spread across Ontario. Um, because of COVID, what we also have done is uh, launched an at-home service. And so you've, we've got our network as well as partnering with the care company, which is essentially a group of at-home health professionals that can come to your house and actually take uh, the sample of cells for you. So curbside service. And um, obviously it, uh, it is important to us to maintain the safety of everybody. So we're not asking people to come down to, to UHN anymore to do this, or even into the local clinic. Um, you don't have to leave your house and uh, all of the, uh, the health professionals at Acorn and the care company um, observe all of the COVID-19 practices uh, to make sure that we're not transmitting the virus and we're checking ourselves routinely. So um, through testing. So it is, uh, it is really an opportunity to make sure that we're thinking about these things and, and I'll get into actually why it is probably imp more important now, more now than, than ever to be thinking about banking yourselves because of, of COVID-19. But first I, I'd love to share analytics. And this is something that uh, most people have been introduced to in, uh, in some of these services that exist right now to analyze genetics. Everybody's probably heard of 23andMe and some of these other groups. And, and it really is our first foray into looking at the information that lies within our cell. The human genome, that first layer that we really have dug into um, is an immense amount of information and really is the coding for us as a person and all life. Um, and there's a lot of information that we can gather from it and learn and understand about ourselves and use that information to one, predict and understand what we may face in the future but then also learn more about ourselves today so that we can actually live a healthier version of our lives. And these are, are things that, that we can understand more of, but how we would actually react to certain medications, right? So very powerful, uh, very powerful tools. But underneath 
genetics, we have all these other layers of the cell. You've got transcriptomics, the RNA. Um, you've got proteinomics, the proteins. Uh, epigenomics, modifications on top of your genetic code. And then metabolomics. So all of these layers, you actually want to analyze these either over time, like epigenetics, or you actually need live cells to analyze these. And so part of ACORN's approach is preparing you for as these new layers of analytics come out, we want to make sure that you're able to compare your health when you take your sample to in the future, your health at any time point. And by having those two distinct time points of your live cells, you'll be able to actually look at disease trajectories and other things that are extremely useful in, in understanding how you're aging, um, you know, what, how your health is either increasing or are there other areas that you can actually give a little bit more focus to live a healthier life. The way we take cells is live cells. Any of the genetic companies that do the swabs or, or the sputum collection samples collect dead cells. And so the analysis would be limited to the genomic information. So we're really excited as well to help prepare people for these amazing analytical tools that are coming in the future. And talking about the genome, um, we can see the progress and how fast these analytical tools move. If you took your entire human genome, it would actually fill up 5,000 regular books just with line by line code. The first human genome cost more than 600 million US dollars to decode and scientists working on segments of it all around the world. You can actually look at that code now. So the lowest price really that, that is available is, is around $600. So you are now, I mean, think about the scale that has, has changed here. We now have access to technologies that, that only a short 10, 15 years ago cost you know, over 600 million. And so this being accessible and the technology driving the analytics in this direction, it's happening across the board on all of the other layers as well. And so we want to make sure because they are coming very fast. There's already 1,200 genetic diseases that we have. So we know that they, these diseases are linked to our genetics. And so there's a lot of useful information that, that we can gather to, to know more about ourselves and live a healthier life. What really is exciting is combining those analytics with all of the tools that we talked about before in regenerative medicine. And that's gonna allow us in the near future to diagnose disease before the first symptom and eliminate it before you ever get sick. Having the tools to identify what you might be facing and the resources and the cells to actually do something about it and stop that in its tracks, that is the future of healthcare. We are not gonna be manufacturing um, drugs in, uh, in, in laboratories with chemical compounds um, exclusively. There will always be a place for that. But we are now gonna actually be looking at ourselves as the next drugs. Our own cells have the ability to restore our health. And that really is, is ACORN's vision for this next, next segment of, of healthcare. And I did mention that it is important to be thinking about these things now more than ever. And one of the most common questions that I get, so I'm probably trying to get a little ahead of the Q&A, um, is what is going on um, around COVID-19. And there has been numerous reports of chronic disease emerging or fast forwarding in individuals after they've recovered from being infected by SARS-CoV-2, especially in patients that develop severe symptoms of COVID-19. One of those um, of nearly 4,000 patients at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York uh, that had to be hospitalized for COVID-19, 46% uh, of them experienced kidney damage. Um, one fifth of those actually requiring dialysis, meaning it's extreme. So this is what is really alarming. A large percentage of them did not have any kidney symptoms or kidney damage going into it. So these things are emerging out of nowhere or fast tracking us into these chronic disease states. And essentially all of these things that we're seeing emerge are targets that regenerative medicine has been working on to try to solve. We know that about 20% in an early study of patients in China ended up uh, being identified with heart damage. And again, a, a study that was done in Germany, um, researchers were looking at the hearts of 100 patients who had recently recovered from COVID-19. And 28 of, of those 100 patients had heart abnormalities. Um, so, is, sorry, 78 of those patients had heart, 
heart abnormalities. This is one of the, the real issues where you ended up having some damage. So where around the body are we not looking at that we are seeing more and more damage? And, and as these studies continue to emerge, we're seeing many symptoms, right? We're seeing hair loss in women that are recovering from COVID-19. Uh, uh, people may have heard of COVID toes. It really is affecting so many different areas of our body because of the way this virus works in targeting a, a specific receptor that is found all over our body. So for, for me, um, I feel a, a much greater heightened responsibility now during these times to try to, to do as much as I can to get the message out and um, give people the opportunity to prepare for chronic disease because um, with, with this unfortunate bad news that we're seeing in patients that are, are emerging post-infection, um, we really may be seeing chronic disease uh, show up much faster. The other question that I get is all about anti-aging. And so I can't talk about harvesting skin cells from hair follicles without talking about skin itself. Um, and so while this might not be as exciting as some of the trials that are ongoing that are attempting to cure Parkinson's and macular degeneration, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't share quite the catchy title that uh, appeared in the Daily Mail. Uh, say bye to Botox, skin cells could be banked and used later in life to iron out wrinkles. And so down in uh, North Carolina, a group of scientists actually studied what it would be like to actually save cells and then uh, reintroduce them. This study is very new. We actually had been working on ACORN um, longer than, than before the study came out, but we were really excited to see people thinking along the same lines, um, albeit for aesthetic reasons. Um, but ultimately, um, it was extremely dramatic. Um, the, uh, the results were 30% better than any other skin treatment, including um, other stem cell treatments and Botox that they have seen. So um, there may be uh, a number of other uses other than saving your life one day for these cells to actually be leveraged to, uh, um, to treat your skin and keep your skin healthy and looking healthy. I think my final message is the future of healthcare is personal. This is something that uh, we need to be thinking about ourselves and, and really be taking ownership in our own health. And I, I am really excited, excited by the, the time that we live in today because we really see more and more people that are taking ownership over their own health and these drives to live healthy lives. And I think that ACORN is one of those things that you can do um, as you plan to live a healthy life. Uh, and essentially to make sure that you have this biologic insurance policy to make sure that um, when it happens, because it does happen to every, everybody, as you do break down over time, uh, you have the best resources at your disposal to do something. We have seen these things happen before. We have predicate technologies that, uh, that we've seen emerge that have forced people to make decisions on whether to predict a, a utility in the future or not. And one of the bis busiest, uh, biggest examples I can think of really is, is around uh, genetic sequencing. So if you were in the 70s or early 80s and you were a police officer um, and you found a, a biological sample at a crime scene, um, you could do analysis on that sample and you could actually determine whether the uh, blood type was A, B, or O. But that's about as far as you could take it. And so police forensic units, they ended up having to make a decision. They knew about DNA. They knew its structure. They knew it existed. They knew it contained data, but they didn't know what. They did not know if it would be useful one day. So they had to make decisions on whether to bank and prepare and, the, and, and invest in the infrastructure to save those biological samples or discard them after they did uh, the analysis that, that was available at the time. And sure enough, in 1984, uh, the first uh, murderer was actually convicted based on leaving DNA evidence at the crime scene. It was a momentous moment and it led to it being uh, essentially part of every single investigation that you'll see is, is seeing if there's any biological evidence left at a crime scene. Um, but it also really exposed the groups that did not prepare. Hundreds of cold cases were able to go back and retrospectively be solved because they had invested in the infrastructure and preserved those cells so they could do that analysis. Unfortunately, uh, for all of the units that did not invest in that, there was no recourse. Um, and there still are a lot of cases that are unsolved. I wanna be on the side that is preparing for that future. I'm optimistic extremely optimistic about the future of healthcare, And I'm very excited to be living in a future and have children in a future 
where they are going to have access to their youngest cells, their younger cells uh, for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Taylor. This, um, Drew. Um, I have a couple of questions actually in terms of the cell therapies that are already people are able to use. I think that it's amazing when we think of the future, but I know that you mentioned there were a lot of them already in place. Mm -hmm. So there, there definitely are. Most of, of the regenerative medicine or tissue engineering therapies that are in place are, are being used in situations where they're still being monitored or it's in compassionate use cases. Uh, for instance, you know, that young woman with uh, spina bifida, um, they ended up um, essentially having a condition that they wanted to try and treat as much as, as they possibly could. And so they attempted to remedy it. Um, it was also in an area where it was the bladder. It wasn't performing, um, it wasn't performing its duty. Um, and it was also not an essential organ from the sense that, you know, if, if they didn't restore that function, that there would be, you know, a, a critical and immediate problem. So a lot of these things are kind of being tested out that way. What we have seen, though, is with skin, we have seen sheets of skin grown out for patients and used for burn victims, um, even for now for diabetic foot ulcers. Um, we saw a approved therapy um, for cartilage recently. Um, now, it's, it's a really interesting, uh, amazing therapy, but it's not recon reconstituting your entire joint. So if you have more focal or concentrated damage in a, in a smaller area. So we're seeing them actually emerge and enter mainstream medicine. But I think that there's much bigger things um, and much more broad sweeping things to come. When you think about some of the trials that are ongoing. So now when I say trial, these are being done in humans, right? It's just being monitored um, and it's not available to everybody, right? They're making sure that it's safe and, and effective. And so those trials ongoing right now are to treat heart disease, macular degeneration, Parkinson's. Um, you know, obviously we, we just saw this uh, the skin trial. Um, so there are a lot of things that are, are being done in humans. They're either in study or they're what we call kind of compassionate use. So like these single instances where they get approved. Tomorrow though, they'll be broad sweeping. So when you say about trial and just, you know, you're in the biotech industry, so you're very used to see hearing this uh, phase one, phase two, and the different trial phases. Um, what would you say in the next 10 years would be the most, um, the, the technologies that have the most potential that you think will happen? I think that the question for our users is to think, okay, I'm going to do this, but what is the real potential for me? Um, yeah. Speaking of biotech is like, is sometimes like a lottery, um, you know, you hear like the vaccine is going to come out and then you hear one biotechnology company that has been Calico, I think 10 years and the trials didn't come out that great. So mm -hmm. um, where's the balance and what are the things that you really think are going to happen sooner rather than later? Yeah. So I think first and foremost, where we're going to see um, the the early applications of, of tissue engineering regenerative medicine are going to be um, in, in two different areas. One is aesthetics. So um, ultimately the risk around aesthetics is not you're trying to save someone's life, right? So there is a different scale um, um, to, to those types of trials and they typically move along um, quicker. And so we may see the aesthetic therapies like the subcutaneous injections for removing wrinkles, use it, leveraging your own younger cells. Like imagine the potential of having your cells from 10 years ago and reintroducing those cells that have not aged for 10 years back into um, your, your face. Like that is extremely powerful. Um, and I think we'll see those very quickly because we're already seeing those in trials. The other side is some of the most severe diseases and also some of the diseases that have a very concentrated area where there's an effect um, can be targeted effectively and are also affecting a large number of people, right? So things like Parkinson's um, and macular degeneration, they either have a, a large population that are, that are being affected by it, or there's a micro niche environment of cells that we're trying to target and replace. And so those ones are effective targets for scientists because the path is clear towards trying to provide a benefit. Some of the things like 3D printing an entire human heart 
while it's extremely exciting that we've already printed miniature ones in, in Israel and they can beat and, and, and hold blood, um, I think that even the scale up process will take years, right? And you look at, at clinical trials when things enter, you can usually anticipate that you know between seven and 10 years after they've entered a phase one, you'll start to see some of the ones that, are do, that do well come to fruition. But what that means is we're seeing things in phase one clinical trials right now and other things that are even further along. So in the next 10 years, right? If you're planning on being around, I'm gonna to wanna to make sure that I take advantage of all these things and have my best version of myself to, to use as the starting material for them. Well, um, we have a couple of medical questions, but before getting to that, I wanna talk about a bit more about ACORN mm -hmm. in the sense that um, I did come and get the, um, get my hair follicle sticky. I mean, it was a procedure of 10 minutes. Okay. I think the bigger question now for people, because you show your patent pending device for at home collection. I know that we have questions with people saying, can you do this in other cities? And in the future, will you be able to ship them from around the globe? Mm -hmm. Is this something that you're planning and your roadmap for what you're Absol doing? Absolutely. So we are a young company, right? Um, and it's an extremely exciting technology. And, and yes, we are, we, we've patented our, our media and our, our kit for, for you know, the actual crux of, of our entire process. Um, and uh, we've patented um, or patent pending kit for, um, uh, for potential home use in the future. Um, but we do uh, service like Ontario right now. And so we've got partner clinics in Guelph and, and Hamilton and, and a number of different cities and areas outside of Toronto. Uh, we've got a representative uh, in Montreal. We've got a representative in Vancouver. So we are trying to cover as much territory as possible as a young growing company. Um, and absolutely, we plan to take this uh, worldwide. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a, an exciting moment for us where, where we're after a lot of work in, in laboratories are actually able to offer this. And, and, um, unfortunately I think that, you know, COVID and, um, has definitely impacted, um, some of the momentum that we had coming out of the gates because it happened very, very quickly after we started, uh, um, to do this live. Um, but we're really excited and have relaunched, um, uh, our lab and our services uh, this past month and make, to make sure that it's available and have really uh, created the service will actually come to your house and do it for you. Um, and so for people in some of the cities that I mentioned, it is accessible. Um, we're trying to get everywhere. Uh, we're in conversations with groups in, in Calgary and other areas to make sure that we can uh, uh, make sure this is widespread across Canada and then obviously in, in the U.S. as well. Yeah, the U well, the U.S. would be the easiest, I guess. I do have a lot of friends in Europe, but I would assume that the technology will require a bit more specifics flying uh, over the Atlantic Ocean of, of the, the ocean. Yeah, it's a, a little too early to talk about, but we, we may have the opportunity to uh, to be in, in Europe one day soon as well. Um, another question in regards to the service, um, and I've discussed this with you, I already asked you, your oldest customer and your youngest customer how soon or how late can you do this so our youngest customer is three and our oldest customer is 82 so it's never too so. late <laughs> well ultimately i think that it's for every individual to make a decision for themselves um you know i suggest everybody look at all the progress that's going on and, and some of the things and and dive in and, and read some of the things because it's not like it, a lot of these things make ma mainstream media right unless it's like skin rejuvenation you know and daily mail picks it up um it's not really in our faces we don't understand how far along um, we are in, in developing these things so i really suggest people um you know have a, uh, spend some time on Google and look up at all the amazing things that are going uh, on all around the world um, and make sure that they're also following regulations. Like any cutting edge industry, there's always people that um, are participating in it that aren't necessarily thinking of your best intentions and they may be going a little bit too fast um, to bring these things to market. We wanna prepare you for them, but we wanna prepare you for the ones that are legitimate and following FDA Health Canada or wherever the country you're in's regulations, right? So we wanna make sure that these are safe and efficacious treatments that are thinking about your health first. Um, so uh, everybody needs to make the decision of when they think um, these things are coming, how far away will, will I benefit from these? And if you look at those years and you're planning to be around, this is for you. It's, it's that simple of a calculation. So that 82 year old, uh, he's planning on living into his nineties 
And he thought his 82 year old cells would be a lot healthier than his 92 year old cells. So he wanted to have access to them. Well, one of the things that we talk a lot about at Mikey Guy is the fact that we have career, um, uh, we have a mindset for our career longevity, for our financial longevity, and our health sometimes falls behind. And I think people, especially after the pandemic, are thinking more and more about how are they going to keep healthy for as long as possible and what measures they can take now uh, for their future. With that, um, we have a question in regards to, do you, do you have um, an example of how many years of research, um, how many years before this research is available to Parkinson's patients, you think? And if you have any yeah. to expect in the cost for yeah. That's a, it's a great question. It's also a difficult one to answer, um, but it's one that we're very passionate about as a company. Um, one of the people that, uh, that works at our company, um, that runs in their family. And I think everybody has something. For me, what, what's on my mind is Alzheimer's, right? So I think, I think everybody has something that they're worried about. Um, Parkinson's is definitely exciting. And the individual working with us is, is you know, very excited about that research that's going on because it's very meaningful to them. Um, and right now it's in phase one of the clinical trial. So they were recruiting patients um, last year. I don't know, um, there hasn't been any other uh, information released on whether COVID-19 delayed the progress of the study, um, but it was being tested in patients um, starting last year. So if we think about how long these trials take um, in the next seven to 10 years, we should hopefully see if that has a path to market. Um, all we can do is, is really uh, um, follow that research and, and it's not in the research phase yet, it's in the trial phase now and, uh, and, and follow the outcomes. And uh, I'm, I'm really optimistic because it does leverage some of the, those amazing tools that we talked about before. I'm very optimistic about its ability to have a, a huge effect. The animal studies before this human trial um, were extremely exciting. Um, another question in regards to the advantage of having your own stem cells versus um, like genetically engineered or now that you can make everything in a laboratory, could you <laughs> also do that in a laboratory? Yeah. Well, we can't make everything yet. And there's <laughs> well, certain things that we don't do ethically, right? Um, we're not cloning anybody. Um, but ultimately, it is always better to have your own cells. Okay, sometimes your cells are going to be damaged. Um, and so that is, is you know, due to disease or old age and things like that. And so they're not gonna be as good of a resource, but it's better to have your own cells as a possibility because ultimately you won't reject them. And one of the biggest complications that we see for donors is actually the necessity for them to go on immunosuppressants. And unfortunately I've, I've known uh, people in, throughout my career that have actually uh, died from complications of getting um, very simple colds and, and pneumonia. Um, because of, they were on immunosuppressants receiving a, a stem cell transfer or cell transfer therapy from a donor. And um, they, they didn't make it, right? So it can be extremely serious. And by using your own cells, um, you're, you're reintroducing yourself to yourself and you don't need to go under those immunosuppressants. And that's a huge advantage in both um, acceptance, recovery, um, and, and susceptibility to other diseases and other infections. So, um, there are going to be instances, right, where donor cells make sense. And leukemia is a perfect example. But um, when we look at the, the plethora of, of possible therapies using, your, using cells, um, there is a, a, a huge number that are going to be autologous, which means we want, we're going to be using your own cells. Cool, well, great. Um, well, speaking of using your own cells, when I speak of this, or uh, when I've talked about your company to other people, I'll tell them that it's, uh, for me, it's the equivalent of how women uh, freeze their eggs. And I say so many of us spend, well, I don't, but I know so many of my girlfriends spend money on uh, Botox. And this is actually, the, the service that you give is actually even more economical than a um, every three month Botox service. And I want you to- Much, much more. <laughs> I want you to speak about that because one of the, I think one of the big issues with um, biotech is that 
um, the science is scary to people. They think it's mm. like out of this, you know, it's the future or it's dangerous. They hear the media talk about CRISP and playing God. And there's, I mean, we need to change the conversation, demystify it, make it like, a, I mean, it's coming. Yeah. It's coming the consumer yeah. the way Botox 10 or 15 years ago, only a certain amount of people had access to it. And mm. now you go to Botox parties. Yeah. In the future, we're probably going to do that too. It's like, let's go pluck our hairs and get our stem cells. Absolutely. But, uh, I want you to talk about the price because I don't want people to think that this is a very out of their um, budget type of situation. It is. Yes. Not. Yeah, no, it isn't. So um, we are, maybe maybe it's because, um, you know, we're, we're a Canadian founded company, but um, we do, uh, we very much fall in line with, with the mindset around healthcare being accessible. And while there are absolutely aesthetic um, utilities um, for these cells, we look at this as these cells could potentially save your life one day and everybody should have this. So we've tried to make this as accessible as possible. So normally there is an upfront fee. We're actually um, running a special thing um, with my key guy today. So that's an exciting announcement. Um, but you will be able to do this without any upfront fee even having somebody come to your home and visit you. And uh, we've made as, it as accessible as Netflix. So for adults, it's $20 a month. And for children, it's $10 a month. So that is the, the current promotion. And as anybody that is a subscriber to uh, my key guy will not pay their first month. So um, it is, uh, it's extremely accessible. Um, and it's really from the mindset of we, we really feel like this should be standard of care. Yeah, it's like, um, as, as I love the line that you use about how it's the Stacey's paying a Netflix subscription. Yeah. And that's the uh, announcement we had for our subscribers because we want to make sure that um, with the service we provide, it does it is a service and uh, our users benefit from the latest and the best that there is in terms of um, preventative wellness. To me, that's what you're doing. It's taking insurance for your health in a very active manner and using science and technology. With that said, we are over our time. So thank you so much for everyone for being here tonight with us. And thank you, Drew, for um, being here as well. We are going to have a replay and we will also be sending a message to our subscribers to remind them of this and um, other events that we have coming up. I want to remind everyone that tomorrow we have another health talk with a French entrepreneur who is doing glucose optimization, which is also super important for aging uh, well and with longevity. Maybe you can join this one, Drew, since I think- Absolutely, you... I'm, I'm a fan. I'm, I'm looking yeah. forward to, uh, to listening in. Um, it's fantastic. Um, I definitely suggest everybody join that as well that's here today. And I, I just saw that there's even more questions that are coming up. Um, so I, I would like everybody to know that we are accessible at Acorn. You can go to acorn.me. Um, any questions that we didn't get to that you have, um, you can probably find them somewhere on our website. But if not, just email us at, at info at acorn.me. And, um, and I'll make sure to, uh, to watch for those and, and uh, make sure that myself or one of our scientists uh, responds very, very quickly. Yes. Um, yeah, well, I did just see them. Um, so many screens, I always, miss, always forget. But do email us and we're going to get these answers to you. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, have a great night. I hope Toronto stays warm where we are and everybody else uh, is not so cold. Amazing. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks all. Bye-bye.